This is Criteria. But, you know, this is two doors down from, I don't know if you saw the news report, there was this bar in East Lansing, Michigan, where 187 people, it was open for one night and 187 people came down with coronavirus. No. So, yes. <laughs> wow. A bunch of Michigan State students. So, wow. That bar is shut down, but this restaurant, which is two doors <laughs> down from it, is open. She is. I'm just grateful that the Archdiocese has resumed, you know, so-called public masses. Yep. That was, I guess, about three or four weeks ago. And honestly, I was surprised. I didn't expect the masses to resume until the fall. I, I get call me really? cynical. Yeah. But I, I was just sort of like so dismayed with the church's response to keeping the sacraments available or not keeping the sacraments available that I just sort of resigned myself to like, well, that's it. But it's been a real blessing, you know, to have the mass available again. I mean, Absolutely. it's. I feel like I'm noticing more people at daily mass than there were before the lockdowns. Mm. So I don't know if that's true, you know, at all the parishes, but certainly at my parish, it seems like there's a higher attendance. And that might just be because people aren't going to work yet. And so there right. are more people who have the opportunity. But yeah, you know, I guess it remains to be seen what the sort of fallout will be, not just in the economy, but like in the economy of grace. There are so many things I've been thinking about in this regard. I Rather than think about anything heady, I'm just going to say my overall experience of quarantine was in several ways fruitful. And, and in part, that was because even though public masses were suspended since I'm a lector at our parish, I never had to go without the sacraments. Wow. Oh, so they had you coming in to read? Yes. There would be uh, about 10 people at mass wow. every week for recording. That's cool. That's great. We have a very talented music minister who just joined, came to the parish, was hired by the parish a year ago. And she actually used quarantine as an occasion to become more liturgically and musically ambitious in a good way. Wow. You know, during quarantine. <laughs> and so she was doing all kinds of, I guess you would call it experimentation with the use of antiphons and Gregorian chant that she hadn't at least tried out that's great too much of yeah, before that's, that. That's so awesome. we had beautiful masses that were being streamed you know from the parish website. I personally didn't have to go without communion, which was nice. And wow. then yeah. And then on that's Sunday great. mornings we were you know, I'd have the mass on where the kids could hear it so they were actually seeing the mass accreting church and then afterwards you know after we had breakfast we would sit around the table as a family and do the liturgy of the word mm -hmm. and so as a father this felt just really great because the kids were not totally detached from mass but we were doing something that we wouldn't otherwise do which was mm -hmm. staying great. with everybody in the family doing their part within the liturgy of the word and just you know since my kids are in public school and they're not getting that daily, you know, I always had daily mass in school. You know, they're not necessarily sitting in school learning the parts of the liturgy and the, mm -hmm. the elements of the liturgy that they should be learning. So this was my chance to do that with them and to explain to them what's occurring in each part. And so that was, I found that quite wonderful. And then I have to say, you know, I was lecturing in, oh gosh, I think late May. And I, before we started recording, I said to my pastor, I said, what do you think, Father, two weeks? He said, no, it'll be longer than that. Uh, but in fact, it was two weeks we, we got mass back. Oh, that's great. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, I also found myself taking very seriously, you know, the idea of, of the father as the priest of the domestic church. My son was born during the craziness, and he was born on Easter Monday. And actually, for the Easter vigil, you know, I had kind of gone out of my way to collate together a whole kind of quasi liturgical proceeding where you know we did all of the readings from the vigil i sung the exultet which i never would have taken the time to learn before but like here in you know my little apartment in washington heights like the exultet was ringing out from our our nice. room and and so there were these paraliturgical experiences that were tremendously consoling but then also kind of uh bolstering in the sense that I think that going through this experience, I have a much more acute sense of of the domestic church and of my role in it. Because I, I went to seminary for three years and discerned out. And in a way, this experience was like 
oh yes, this is all I wanted, like to be a priest, but the priest of my family, you know, and, and have the best of both worlds, That's so cool. to speak, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was really, really neat. The other thing that, you know, there were so many complaints about the cowardice of the church and I could see why some people were feeling I'm guilty to, to say that, guilty. but yeah, in our diocese, the bishop told priests they weren't to close their churches. They were just to suspend mm. public masses. So we had perpetual adoration at our parish. Wow. So yeah, why don't we start this officially with a formal sure. beginning? Well, no, I mean, we, we already started it. This is criteria. All right, stop that. Just do it organically, but it's too late for that now. <laughs> James, feel free to get yourself a beer if you want to join in the drinking. I'll get a beer later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's going to be a little confusing today in today's episode because we have two Jameses here. Yeah. Well, I was thinking that we could call you by your middle name, Thomas, and that would be less confusing. But then we would just have two oh, Thomases. Wait, yeah, that's a good point. So I was thinking we could call you. <laughs> I, I I was thinking we could call you Pavel after the <laughs> little boy in the, our previous discussion because you're Polish. This is a radio morning show. It's not a podcast. That's right. Is it? This, that's this, yeah. That's kind of what we're. That's kind of what we're going for here. So we're here with our friend, five-time Catholic culture podcast guest, poet, and philosopher. Some have called him the Grand Dragon of American Catholic Letters, James Matthew Wilson. James, thank you for being here. I'm pleased to be here, or at least I was until a second ago. I haven't heard anybody <laughs> call me the Grand Dragon before, and I'd like <laughs> it in writing to know who. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that up. I thought. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking today about Ingmar Bergman's Wild Strawberries, and we selected this film actually at James's suggestion. If I remember correctly, James, we asked you if there were any of the films on the list that you'd be interested in talking about, and you shot us a few, I think three or four names or titles rather, and. Wild Strawberries jumped out at me because, I guess, because I'd never seen it. And so that's why we chose it. There's no more profound reason for selecting this film than that. But I would like to hear from you why you were interested in talking about Wild Strawberries. Well, the great European directors that I like are the ones that pretty much everybody likes. Fellini and, and Bergman, both of whom capture in their work so well both the sort of Mediterranean Catholic spirit and then in Bergman this more pondering Kierkegaardian Lutheran Protestant sensibility of agonizing with the soul and there are Bergman films that are more more indeed brooding and more frightful to be sure the seventh seal is one of them. I think I, that might have been on the list too. I can't remember. That's right. Yeah. I think that Bergman has two films on the Vatican film list. And I think Fellini also has yeah. two so films. So Eight and a Half, La Strada, and then Seven Seal and Wild Strawberries. Right. So clearly the Vatican agrees with your estimation of these two directors and their relative worth. They capture such a spirit of a, of, you know, a period in European civilization, but they're not just period piece writers, there's something genuine, especially in Bergman's case, there's something so perceptive about the confrontation of a soul alone with itself in, in so many of his movies that I deeply respect. And I was surprised actually to see Wild Strawberries there. It's been a number of years since I started going through Bergman's filmography and, and Wild Strawberries stuck out to me as one of his great films. But I really thought that that was just my personal response to it. It seemed in some respects as kind of a minor film compared to the ambition of some of his, his other works, The Seventh Seal being just an obvious one. And yet, I think it's precisely because, though it has all of the things that established Bergman as a great filmmaker, it's also a kind of a gentler film than some of his other work. And that Isaac Borg, the doctor who's the main character in the film, is in his own way a gentle character who, even though we're told in the film that he has had a hellish marriage and that it's clear that the film is about how he's failed in his life in so many ways, despite the film is actually superficially a triumphal progress of him to 
received this Jubilee Award for his 50 years of service as a doctor and as a scientist. He's not as obviously a failed human being as, in fact, the film leads us to believe he is in his superficial, in his persona. And so it's a film that's kind of easier to watch because he's a very appealing man. I mean, he just seems like a wonderful man on the screen. So I had seen The Seventh Seal and I had seen The Virgin Spring. Those were the only two Bergman films that I had seen before watching Wild Strawberries. And similar to what you've said, Wild Strawberries just struck me as very, well, on the one hand, evocative of what I already knew of Bergman, but then on the other hand, very tonally different and varied and a little bit more of, well, you said gentler, but maybe a lighter. I guess with the Bergman films I've seen before, I expect more to be devastated or depressed or somber. But with this, I found it very heartwarming, very touching. Well, this was my introduction to Bergman. And, you know, my impression of Bergman, I, you know, I guess maybe just on hearing people talk about The Seventh Seal was it was going to be kind of, you know, grim Nordic black metal like all the way through. <laughs> But, you know, I didn't really know what to expect with a film by Bergman called Wild Strawberries. Didn't seem like a very grim title for a film. So I feel like this was a good introduction because it, it has such a tonal range. And one thing that I was reflecting on, you know, along with what you were saying, James, about the fact that this protagonist is charming and gentle on the surface, is that this film uses a lot of humor and yet it's humor that it does offset the the grimmer aspects of it. But, but the humor also communicates those darker aspects as well. Like maybe because it's partially about his way of deflecting and his way of appearing charming on the surface, that the humor actually both relieves you from and yet reinforces in some senses the darker elements of the story. I, I wish I could think of a, of a specific line or a specific example, but it was just something that was going through my head earlier. We learn over the course of the film that Isaac has had a horrible marriage with his late wife. The first time we see him, he's a grouchy widower with a housekeeper who's lived with him and served him for 40 years and clearly very attached to him such that she does not want him to divert, depart in the slightest from the schedule that she has set for him that day, because this is going to be, as she puts it, the greatest day of her life when she sees him <laughs> receive the award. You know, that attachment of the domestic servant is usually a pretty reliable index that we have a, a protagonist who is a good person somewhere mm -hmm. deep down. And yet, of course, Marianne, his, his daughter-in-law, when we first, Isaac and she set off on the journey to the award ceremony together in the car. And of course, the whole film is there almost from the beginning and almost to the end is their car journey down to the award ceremony. It's clear that she doesn't like him, that they're estranged, even though for some mysterious reason she has come to his house. And yet at every turn, he's gentle with her and listens to her in a way that eventually we see is, is in stark contrast with his one child, his son, Evald, who is her husband, who's so harsh in the first scene where we encounter him, where she's recalling to her father-in-law how she's told his son that she's pregnant. And then one more thing, Phoebe Anderson, who plays two roles in the film, she's the, the peroxide Sarah? blonde, yes. jeans-wearing, oh my Swedish gosh, she's amazing. teenager, yeah, who's hitchhiking her way to Italy with the two, <laughs> with the atheist and the future Lutheran minister. She's so amazing. She's life itself. And if you look at, as at Isaac's eyes, at Victor, I don't even know how you say his last name. Solstrom. No, I'm uh, Sjostrom. Yeah. Sjostrom. Did you look it like up? <laughs> well, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's, yeah. it yeah. looks like it's Sjostrom. But I don't know how the umlauts work in Swedish. I was just going to say, once you have a name with more than one umlaut, I'm in trouble. Right. So, <laughs> but every time he looks at her, she's always in the back seat of the car and he's leaned back in his reclining passenger seat and he will and so he'll edge his head back to her to try to you know get a look at her out of sideways and you can see how soft and welcoming his eyes are to everything she says so mm -hmm. i think first of all that explains in part 
why this movie is appealing because it's it has the dark broodingness of all of Bergman's films, but you can recognize that the characters are are human and possibly redeemable along with what's condemned them. And second of all, I mean, really, that look of that melted, gentle look of Isaac at Phoebe as she's in the back seat really is also what the movie is about, which is the ability, after having failed in life and bearing a tremendous load of guilt because you have failed as a father, as a husband, and in other basic human ways, to still somehow be able to look on life with that slightly glassy-eyed gaze of openness and hope that is an openness to new life. It's interesting that actress plays those two roles of the BB in the car in the present, but then also Sara in the past, because this openness to life kind of extends in both directions. It's not just, you know, the life that, that you have and that you can look out to the future, but also what's come behind. But I, I wanted to ask before we go further, what you guys thought about the sort of report that we receive about Isaac throughout the film from other characters. We have, you know, first, obviously, Marianne. Well, she's not the first one who who calls him crabby and selfish and only listening to himself. That's Agda, the housekeeper. Agda. But then definitely Marianne presents the most, you know, damning estimation of him. But she qualifies it by saying... I only know you as a father-in-law. And I think that in a lot of ways, we see her get to know him in a deeper, more comprehensive way through the events of the film. But I, I think that a reading of the film is going to be dependent on to what extent we trust the report that's given to us of Isaac from the other characters. And then I guess in a certain extent of himself, from his own subconscious in, in, in his dreams. So I'll, I'll pose that question. Well, I think I mostly credit it. You, d- you do make a good point about her saying, I know you as a father-in-law, and clearly she's coming. Her understanding of him is very much colored by the fact that he raised this, this son that she's married to. So she's, she's going to maybe attribute some of her son's traits to her father-in-law or her, her husband's traits to her father-in-law. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, based on his, his dreams, his dis-ease, you know, throughout the film in various ways, his relationship with his mother and some of the, his reactions earlier on in the film, I tend to credit this characterization of him. I mean, if you look at when she's being very frank with him earlier, early on the film, he, you know, he seems very unruffled or he makes a point of seeming very unruffled and kind of like blasé about all the things that she says to him. And he's just kind of treating it with amusement, you know, her candor. And I think the first, other than his first dream, which is obviously disturbing to him, the first time you see him be really unsettled is when she just tells him that your son hates you. And then he looks really, you know, struck by that. But I think this film was really interesting because it I felt like it helped me to understand the character of Lady Marchmain in Brideshead Revisited. I also thought about um, Brideshead Revisited while watching this. Because I th- I love Brideshead Revisited and I think one of the chief questions that I've had in reading that and in watching the the classic miniseries has been what exactly is the deal with Lady Marchmain? What is it what is her problem? What what is wrong with her? Because it's it's subtle in some ways, you know, if you're not like inside that relationship. Other people, you know, don't necessarily understand why her children have a problem with her. And I think that the, the key that I remember is I think maybe Sebastian and Charles have gotten in trouble. And, and there's a scene where, you know, something about Sebastian saying, you know... Mummy was saintly about the whole thing, of course, and he says it in such a way that he really resents this, you know. Which is echoed by in this film by the flashback he has of seeing his wife conducting this affair, and yes. she sort of plays in her head what it's going to be like when she tells him, and he's going to be very saintly. But about also it. the first flashback to Sarah when she's left the the meal with her family and her mm-hmm. sister is coming to console 
her and she's talking about how inadequate, morally inadequate she feels in relation to Izak, little Izak. So it's always interesting to find two kind of parallel characters in different works of fiction. And I felt that the two kind of shed light on each other for me because I was, I sort of got it with Lady Marchman, but I did struggle a little bit to kind of see exactly how is it that she's hurt her children so badly. And it seems to have a lot to do with that, like outwardly imperturbable kind of saintly demeanor where forgiveness is offered offered it in such a way that it's it's held over you in some way or it's not really forgotten or something like that. There's certainly a mystery to the film that's increased by, just to repeat the point from earlier, that Isaac's gentility and his, his at least evident decency and politeness, and yet there's a clear failure in both his in his ambitions, in his marriage, and in the way he has reared his son. And actually, the the slight fissure between appearance and what's evidently going on beneath the surface occurs in several places. One that, that I keep thinking of is this, the scene with the, the grandmother. They stop as they're driving. They stop at, not the grandmother, excuse me, the mother, at Isaac's mother's home and it's really hard to do a calculation of how can she, she can still be alive because he's 78 <laughs> and she's a pretty spry you know let's be let's say that he was her first child so she's a pretty spry 98 year old she moves about the room and shows various mementos pretty pretty energetically <laughs> and in fact there's on the one hand you know a classic european type of the mother-in-law in that you could see that she makes her firm pronouncements and that she has her finger in everybody's business and is not surrendering her control on life just yet. And yet the signal statement that she makes during the visit of Isaac Hersan and his daughter-in-law, Marianne, who, who we you know, I think later learn is pregnant, is she says, I had 10 children. She had 10. Isaac only has one son. And then we're soon to learn that one son does not want the one child his wife has conceived and, in fact, wants nothing to hold him to the world because life itself is terrible and he wants to die as soon, he wants to be stone cold dead as soon as he can be. I think that that suggests a real powerful lesson of what's occurring in the broader world that Bergman's depicting, which is a world where little by little, generation to generation, an entire people can no longer look on the world with any confidence that it's good and that it should be open to life because that life will be an affirmation of the God who has made things because there may in fact be no God as Evald very much indicates. All of that's operating in the film. And yet when they leave the mother-in-law, the one thing that Marianne recalls is her coldness and she feels like she can't respond to it. And that's either a failure of filmmaking, which I don't think it is, or there's just Bergman has just found a way to create at least to build at least two layers of significance into all of his characters, including the mother-in-law, who is on the one hand a symbol of, at one point, a culture open to life of the past, and on the other hand, she's also a symbol of why people don't want to have children. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that scene because I, I thought that that scene was also really significant. Speaking of Marianne's sort of response to the mother in that scene, through that whole scene, it continues to cut back to the face of Marianne. In fact, right from the beginning, if I remember correctly, when she walks in, we get sort of a solid few seconds just close on Marianne's face as she's just taking in the room and the mother. And I think that we're signaled in that moment as viewers that Marianne is watching this and that something's going on. And it continues to cut back to her as she observes and she picks up the doll that the, the mother made for her daughter. And, and you can tell that there's, there's some sort of gears turning in her head that she then, you know, sort of clues us in on a little bit when she's later having her conversation with Isaac in the car and, and sort of says about how, yeah, she recalled this coldness in the mother and then the coldness in Evald. And I actually think that that just as Bergman is 
illustrating how a people can, there's this sort of dreadful half-life decay on an enthusiasm for life or, or even an acceptance of it. I think he also provides the way out of that because I think that for Marianne, and this is my reading, but I think that for Marianne, that experience of the mother and specifically of seeing Isaac with his mother is a beginning for her understanding and, and beginning to unravel what's kind of gone on with Evald. In a lot of ways, I look at this film as a dramatization of the struggle with the father, of wrestling to to find the father or find a relationship with the father. Because I think that I tend not to credit uncritically what's said of Isaac in the film. I think it's, you know, obvious that something has that there have been failures and that there have been mistakes. But then also there are these indications of him being this I mean, when he stops at the gas station and Max von Sydow's character is like, yeah, we should name our son after you. I mean, it's so obvious that there's more to this character. And then, you know, in the response that the young people have to him. So I tend to take what's said about him with a certain grain of salt in the same way that I I take what's said about Lady Marchmain from Sebastian with a certain grain of salt. Mm. And I'm looking at Marianne as the protagonist of this beginning resentment, this beginning sort of, she says, I only know you as a father-in-law, but I I dislike you. I resent you, as you said, Thomas, because of her experience with Evald, by looking at what this father has begotten and its imperfection and even its terribleness, she can't help but resent Isaac for that. Sure. But then as she gets to know Isaac and then as she sees the mother before him, and even in that scene, I noticed that there's a moment where Bergman frames Isaac standing next to his mother seated. And then behind her is this very kind of looming portrait of another man, ostensibly some other you know, family figure, but perhaps maybe even Isaac's own father or her father. And you get a sense of the lineage of brokenness. And when you begin to unravel that lineage, then you also begin to see how forgiveness can enter in and how there can be redemption. I think that at the end, when Isaac goes to sleep and has the dream where Sara, you know, it's like it's like in Dante's Paradiso, where he's led, you know, by this beautiful woman to the father. I think that Bergman is indicating that it's perhaps maybe in doing the work of going back and finding the father, excavating the father, so to speak, that 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 there can be new life because we begin to see that Evald is being given another chance by Marianne, that he might even welcome this child and that there's there is some hope. Well, it's really interesting that you say that because you know, I took the last shot of the film where he gazes upon his parents and it's a happy memory of them to be an indication of kind of like recovering, you know, the positive elements of one one's parents mm. and, you know, the, the happiness that one did have in childhood at times, you know, when maybe the negative memories can predominate. So that, that makes me more sympathetic to your inter- interpretation. I had taken the response of the kids and the gas station attendants to be more in an in, in indication of, first of all, that this guy does have some genuinely likable traits in his, his outward personality, but also that he is a respected community figure. And, and there is something where, you know, Sarah says, you know, only people who have lived with you at close quarters, you know, know what you're really like. So, you know, I, I've known people or had friends in high school whose parents were, you know, I was in a position to know some of the negative traits of these parents, but in the community, because of how they did their jobs and how they interacted with people as a public face, you know, they were very liked and respected. So I, I took that as like, this guy's really good at his job. He probably did, you know, perhaps he did medical work for people for free at times, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean that what the people closest to him see is is incorrect. But it's just a contrast 
but yeah, that gas station scene is, is very striking, especially as it comes after they've met this other couple on the road and kicked them out of their car. This is like such a happy couple. You know, the woman is smiles, has a smile on her face the entire time. It's like really like a breath of fresh air in the mm. film. Revisiting this film after a few years, I actually revisited it right after watching Bergman's miniseries from the early 1970s called Scenes from a Marriage. And there are a number of analogs between the two films, including actually, I'm forgetting who, I think B.B. Anderson, who's in Wild Strawberries, plays a role in Scenes from a Marriage from almost two decades later. But in Scenes from a Marriage, one thing really comes out, and that's Bergman's protagonist, his male characters, are all formed by another Scandinavian writer's vision, and that's Ibsen. And all of Ibsen's plays, nobody reads Ibsen anymore. I do. Oh, do you? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Only because I'm an actor. So, you know, I, what I see, The Doll's House, when I was at my college theater, when I was an undergraduate, but I mostly know Ibsen just because you have to know something about Ibsen to know understand Joyce, because so much of Joyce's characterizations, Stephen Dedalus, come from Ibsen. But they're all sort of, you know, low-grade Nietzschean protagonist, proto-Nietzschean protagonist at Ibsen. That's the, the bourgeois individual man who needs to be free for his own self-assertion to realize himself. And Ibsen valorizes that heroic action, even though he also shows the consequences of it. And watching Seeds from a Marriage, I realize that Bergman takes that character and he shows that, as is often the case, often these supposedly great men who need the freedom to assert themselves and therefore must desert or abandon their family in order to actualize their individuality, that a lot of the time these people are just mediocrities and they have no self really that needs to be asserted. They just think they do. And then, so scenes of a marriage is really two thirds of it is living in the aftermath of a fellow who's so super abounding in confidence in his singular poetic vision for the world realizing, in fact, that he's just restless and not that impressive and slowly coming to terms with that by having an affair with his ex-wife. You know, something of that's going on here and that is clear is Isaac bears a great burden of guilt because he's failed in some fundamental ways. But just what you were just saying, Thomas, he's a country doctor, too. Yeah, country doctors are, are the, you know, the typically self-effacing bourgeois hero. Right, the one who takes something less than the grand appointment in the metropolis, even though he he is also a specialist in, in specific biological discipline. But a lot of his career has been spent just serving in a rural community, helping mothers give birth to their children. And so he bears a burden of guilt, but not because he's asserted himself and, and hurt people in consequence, but in fact, because he's failed to pursue any great dream for which there would be a consequence. So Sarah, to whom he's secretly engaged, kisses his brother and ends up marrying his brother. And so he marries another woman. And so there's an appeal to his easygoingness, his self-effacingness, his willing to, to serve others in some ways. But there's also a failure on his part, I think, to form his marriage and to form his son in a way that's capable of affirming the goodness of, of existence. And I think that's part of the guilt that he bears and that guilt that rears its, itself point blank or baldly when Evald is confronted with the fact that he's about to have a child or his wife at least is carrying his child. And he rebukes his wife with even suggesting the possibility yeah. that bringing a new life into the world could be not only a good thing, that it could even be an acceptable thing, something that he would even consent to. Do you guys remember the very first line in the movie? I remember that he describes relations between people as being only bound up in sort of judging and evaluating one another's behavior. Character and behavior. Character and says. behavior. And so that's why he withdrew. So what does that mean to you? I mean, does that mean he has a negative judgment of other people's character and behavior or that... He feels that he's judged only on his character and behavior. Or... Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because that opening text, coupled with the beginning scene, the first scene between him and the 
house servant was really what got me thinking about this sort of how we judge one another and how how messy human relationships are and how so much is lost, you know, like missed connections. I was wondering if Bergman wasn't trying to point to the impossibility of human relationship, if not impossibility, but like the challenges and the obstacles and the necessary deficiencies of that, that that I cannot know you absolutely in your deepest identity. Only only God knows you that way. And so in the meantime, I'm kind of having to contend with viewing you through my subjective lens and, and interpreting your behavior. And and if you're also someone who's a little bit of awkward or, or like Isaac says at the beginning that he's, a, he's an old pedant, that maybe there can be some frustration in not being able to manifest yourself the way that you want to be known. And I think that in that interaction between him and Agda at the beginning, there is this really, it's at times humorous, but certainly endearing back and forth where they're kind of, you know, on the one hand, he's saying like, oh, I, I'm a, I can do it myself. I'm an adult. But then as soon as she offers to pack his tails, you know, he's like, oh, you no know, one packs as good as you do. Or, or when she offers to make him something to eat, oh, yes, please, if you would be so kind. But then there's there's coldness again, and it goes hot, cold, and he's trying to apologize to her by giving her a book because he can't stand resentment. And then when she comes back and asks him if he'd like any tea or whatever, and he says, no thanks, so, well, what are you cross for? There just seems to be this sort of disconnect between the two of them. And I, I wonder if that isn't illustrating this line that you've pointed to, Thomas, about the frustration that Isaac feels at not being able to be known the way that he wants to be known. And then that's what got me thinking about how these characters have experienced the father in their life or the mother or the husband or whomever, and this sort of messiness of beginning to forgive and understand and reach out. And and it doesn't mean that people are exactly wrong about his character and behavior. It just means if that's all they go by, right. then something is missing. Yes. At least the, the possibility of redemption, right? So I think maybe that being the first line in the movie helps us to understand, uh, you know, helps us with our discussion of whether the other people are right in their judgment of him. It, right, may, well, it may be that they are right, but they just are missing. If something. I can say one more thing, I, I think that when we see his dream where he's sort of brought into this examination room and he's under the gaze of this kind of tribunal of the younger generation and on the board is written, you know, I, I don't know if it's any particular language or if it's just dream nonsense, but the first rule of or the first law of being a doctor the first thing is to ask forgiveness yeah to always ask forgiveness it's striking because you would think it might be to forgive others but it's to ask for forgiveness yes and that this is sort of the the thing that comes out most clearly in this dream i think that that's the solution for being judged and not being known the way you want to be known or not being able to manifest what it's like i have to ask for forgiveness I have to ask for forgiveness from my son. I have to tell him right. that I love him. He has to know that I'm not perfect. Right. As you were talking, one of the things that came to mind was the old essay by Virginia Woolf, where she talks about the different national traditions of the novel. She says, if I open up a Russian novel, I expect to see a disembodied soul wandering through the streets of St. Petersburg. That the externals of life in Dostoevsky are just irrelevant. It's everything is about the interior drama of the soul. And I think something of the same can be said for the sort of Protestant interiority of Bergman's films in general. And we get tastes of that with Isaac because he goes into these dreams where truly he is disembodied. It's oh, the world has become his his soul or what's the turmoil in his soul. And yet what we see over the course of the film is that the outcome of this trial or this adjudication of the guilt of his soul, which is interior, it's hidden from the world, it's, as Thomas was suggesting, maybe not entirely knowable by the world, maybe frustratingly not knowable at all by the world. At every turn, that interior drama of the soul 
has to come back out of the dream and realize itself in the, the making or the marring of a relationship with another person. Let me just give you one, the, the sort of subplot that does that as well, which is Sarah's character with the, the atheist and the future minister. I mean, it's almost a, a, a psychomachia, right? We have the theist and the atheist who finally get into something like a, a punching fight, <laughs> at least a pushing match in the bushes yeah. before they reluctantly come and sit on opposite sides in the backseat of the car with Sarah in between them as the drive continues everything's so abstract in that moment, right? It's, it's truly belief or unbelief fighting it out. And then they, they're forced to come back in the car. And, and I think it's before they come back in the car. Next time, in any case, Sarah's alone with Isaac. She says something like, doesn't it seem silly to believe in God? And he just sort of chuckles and laughs <laughs> to himself. And you get this. What is that? What is that moment? Well, I don't think we're supposed to take Bibi's statement seriously that it's silly to believe in God and that ends the debate, but rather that she exists on the plane of her life with others and her relationship with these two, in some ways, polar opposite male characters. And so whatever they argue about in the abstract is finally going to have to resolve itself in the way in which they live with her or travel with her down the road. And I think that that's one of the troubles with interpreting this, this film, is that on the one hand, Isaac has clearly damaged his son in some way, but we don't really know how. He's failed in life in ways that we know how, that we don't know the extent of the failure. He's given up his first love for a wife he clearly didn't love as much. But at every turn, whatever his interior psychomachia may be, both the way we know it's occurred, and the way we also doubt that it could be as bad as it sometimes seems in the dream sequences is precisely because he seems like a fairly humane person who's capable of forming relationships with others. And so, of course, then the great mystery and burden of the film is the fact that clearly, in the case of Evald, his son, he's failed where it mattered most. And that this is the great guilt that he bears and that can only be overcome if he can look on the world and upon his son with the tenderness on which he looks on, on Sarah sitting in the backseat of the car. Since you brought it up, how important is that debate over God in this film? I think what's interesting is that it brings the theistic question into the film in a way that seems so incidental and playful that we might not otherwise notice it. And in fact, the girl, the character who brings it into it is the, is the one who's the most free-spirited and carefree. And as I said, she doesn't think abstractly at all. And the least, she's the one who's least interested in the question, I think. Yes. Yet she carries it into the film with, her, with the two boys. I, you know, we mentioned Fellini at the outset. I'm reminded of the opening scene of La Dolce Vita, where a helicopter is transporting a giant crucifix across Rome. And the helicopter pauses above the roof of an apartment skyscraper because up on top of the roof are a bunch of Roman girls in bikinis sunbathing. <laughs> and then they stand up and they wave at the, <laughs> at the pilot and, the, and his, the co-pilot in the helicopter. And you just get this sense that Rome is the Catholic city. It's the center of the spirituality of the world. And yet the people who live there are, in fact, are thinking about their tan lines. And so they're frivolous. And of course, that's kind of an indictment on Rome and Fellini's hands. Here, Bergman with Sarah's character, she's not frivolous, but her playfulness and her, her, her spiritedness, which is not thoughtful, is not introspective, is offered to us as the one doorway to some kind of hope, precisely because she refuses to let her life be dictated by this interior drama of belief or unbelief. It's not that belief and unbelief are unimportant. They're the center of everything. But the decision one makes for belief and unbelief inside the soul will be borne out, will have consequences for mm. one's family and for the life one lives in the world. And that's just what Isaac is, is wrestling with, is he doesn't know. It's clear that he's failed to have faith, and that failure of faith has been communicated to his son. And so the stake... The burden in this trial of his soul is not just whether his soul is good or evil, but rather how the life that he's lived with this soul 
has gone out into the world and, of course, brought new life into it for some people, but also turned his own son against bringing new life into the world. I think that this theistic strain is linked up with the broader concerns of the film, or I should say more particular concerns of the film, because it doesn't get more broad than God. But in the moment, sort of, it's around the halfway point, I suppose, but it has a feeling of a sort of climactic quality where they're they're on the coast and they're having lunch and they start each of them reciting this poem that they all somehow know the ultimate line of that is delivered by Isaac directly into the camera it's the only time that this happens in the film and he's looking straight into the camera straight out at us he's framed right in in the middle and he says i see his traces wherever flowers bloom and that I thought kind of links up with, well, what is the sort of the precipitating image of this drama? It's the, the wild strawberries right. kind of bookend this dilemma yeah. because at the beginning he goes to the house and he has this flashback precisely upon seeing where the wild strawberries grow. And then at the end, when he's dreaming, Sara comes to him and says, there are no more wild strawberries left. Your auntie wants you to find your papa. And he says, I, but I don't know how. And she leads him. And so where I see his traces, wherever flowers bloom, well, what about where the wild strawberries grow? And what are the wild strawberries? And what are these traces of, of him? That feels like a key to me. Would you like some research about the title? Sure, lay it on us. Okay. So the title in Swedish is, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but it's, it's one word, Smultron Stalet, literally means patch of strawberries, but idiomatically, it's actually a Swedish idiom, meaning an underrated gem of a place with personal sentimental value. Hmm. Apparently, the metaphor is built in in Swedish language. Gotcha. I was just, before joining you guys today, I was writing on Augustine and memory. For Augustine, God is present in the soul at the very center of the memory as the source of the memory. So in one sense, God's not in your memory. In another sense, he is because he's what constitutes the existence of your memory. The strawberry patch means you know to go to a place that's some innermost core of your being and therefore has sentimental value. And that's what Isaac does. I mean, literally going back in his flashback at the summer house to the strawberry patch where Sarah adulterates their marriage before it could even begin. And then that poem, I'm forgetting the author's name, but the poem is precisely about looking into nature and finding traces of God in nature. It's, it's a very Lutheran Augustinian hymn in the sense that you see the things of God's creation and they announce themselves in the hymn the way Augustine would put it in the confessions. They announce themselves, they say, we are not he who made the world but we are created by the one who does. And so they're simultaneously diminishing themselves as natural, but also recognizing that they're vicars or signs of the one who made all things. When so much beauty in every vein of creation and life fail, how beautiful must the source be, the eternally true. I think this poem kind of helps get towards what has been you know, driving my, my thinking about this film, that the interior drama of the soul manifests itself in Isaac's relationships with others in the world, but also his relationships with others in the world are pointing back toward the question of the existence of God or not, so that the goodness of creation and the goodness of life are bound up, are separate questions, but nonetheless bound up with the interior question of, is God in the center of one's memory? Is he there or not? Yeah, and that is what the link that I perceived between this poem and the image of the wild strawberries, that's what it got me thinking about is, is how God is present. I think it's clear that Bergman is very interested in memory as a subject to be investigated in this film because that's where he leverages the camera and different cinematic devices most effectively is when we're in these flashbacks because they're clearly not literal. They're not 
I mean, you could depict a literal flashback in a film, like it goes fuzzy and now we see things just as they were. But that doesn't seem to be what Bergman does in this film because we see a kind of dreamlike representation yeah. of the way we remember things, specific images. When he first has the memory of his childhood home, everybody's dressed in white and the set is very brightly lit and, and it gives this visual contrast to the kind of the on-screen, I'll call it palette, that we see in the present. But, you know, I don't think it's that, you know, literally everybody was wearing white in his childhood, but that there is something suggested about the luminescence of, yeah. of nostalgia. But then also in the characterizations of people, Uncle Aaron is very sort of clown-ish, and you get the sense that that's not necessarily a historically accurate portrayal of Uncle right. Aaron, but instead how Uncle Aaron was viewed by Isaac still later when he has the flashback of um, his wife in the woods, you know, he's viewing her from the charred remains of this uh, burned uh, structure. And then her laugh, her laugh is repeated a few times, almost identically each time. It may very well have been the same audio track, but it even has a little reverb on it. And it's given this sort yeah. of... Yeah, in some of the sequences, there's like an echo where the sound is repeated like at the same volume, actually. Yes. Like, Immediately after. Yeah, so so I think Bergman is is using these sort of technical cinematic devices to give a kind of you know it's a non literal representation of memory on the screen, which I just want to want to draw attention to because we've been talking so much about like the themes and the symbolism, but I, I think that also this film is very alive cinematically in the way. Bergman is using the camera and using film as a medium. And so, yeah, so I to just go all the way back to what I was saying about his traces and the flowers that bloom, you know, I, I was thinking about, yeah, it's so odd how memory functions and how there are these these things that re reside in our memory and, and yet so many other things that just evaporate. And it must be that God is involved in that somehow, if not for any other reason than, as you pointed out, James, that Augustine says, that, that he holds it together in existence, but also that these could be gifts, that these are kernels, that these are berries to be harvested in my psyche to lead me back to him. It's really interesting how, as you say, you know, dreams and memories are the, the line is blurred in this film because we've been calling them dreams or flashbacks and not really distinguishing between the two in our discussion so much. But, you know, a number of them, the, the last one in the film is him choosing to go back into memory mm. and of childhood. It's not a dream. And likewise, the first flashback we get that's not the dream in the beginning, the one where they go to the site of the old vacation home. That's it's him falling into memory, but he's seeing things that he wouldn't have actually seen right. because he wasn't present at that dinner. He wasn't present for the discussion between the sisters where they talk about him. So that's kind of interesting in itself. But I liked what you were both saying about memory being fundamental to this film because I, I wanted to talk more about the dreams and the cinematic aspects of them. And, and one of them, you know, in the first dream that he has, some of the I think some of the symbolism is fairly clear i mean with the coffin and you know all that stuff and all this stuff about death i think the first thing he sees that freaks him out is this clock well there's eyes under it there's there's eyeglasses with with eyes under it but there's a clock with no hands and then he looks at his watch and it has no hands and this isn't his watch this is a watch that his father owned that is still in his mother's possession as we find out when he visits her she's thinking of giving it to Siegfried's son, I think, who has turned 50 or is about to turn 50. And I don't know what you guys think about this, but it's especially interesting with what James was talking, Matthew Wilson was talking about <laughs> in regards to God being at this, the center of memory, because to me that evoked that the lack of hands evoked like kind of like time collapsing in on itself. And like, so you've got all these numbers representing the, the span of time, but there's no way of knowing where you are. So you're just looking at the, there's nothing to direct you to any particular point. So you're, when you're looking at that watch or that clock, you're just looking at the span of time itself. And 
obviously that relates to how he's remembering all these things and also how the span, maybe how the span of time is confronting him in his real life because he's seeing all these different stages of life with reminding him of his, of his own life with this, this horrible couple that they meet on the road and with the, the younger people and with his mother. But also the fact that, you know, he's really freaked out by seeing this watch and this clock and then looking at his watch. And I wonder if that's maybe because it kind of represents like his inability to escape the span of time and the memories and the events of the past. Because this is someone clearly who, in a way, like relishes remembering the past. There's in one of the dream sequences where the dream version of the husband from the couple that they meet is showing him this memory. He says, you know, most people just remember their long dead wife with a nice photograph, but you can call this entire scene back to to mind after, you know, however many decades. And it's interesting because if that's the case, then clearly that's to some extent by his choice, but it's also something that he doesn't like, something that he wants to escape from. And perhaps the, his reaction to seeing that clock without any hands also represents that, that he feels like trapped in this collapsed version of the events of his life. I think it's a wonderful analysis. The, the clock without hands stands out in the film, at least in my memory, precisely because when you first see it, the dream sequence where it appears is, is right at the beginning right. of the film. And so it's easy to feel prepared to give it an interpretation based upon the dream. Well, of course there are no hands on the clock because death is timeless. And, and, it's, and it's his death that he's worrying about and pondering and the failure of his life in that, that first dream. But then when we see that it's also an heirloom watch that has no hands, everything that seems merely interiorized, merely to take place within the memory in the sense of within the soul, we realize has been shaped by, to make a play on heirloom, by his mm -hmm. heritage, that is to say by the life that this family has lived out over multiple generations and over which somehow he's failed to be an adequate steward. It's super interesting that he keeps being confronted with things from his memories in real life, right down to the same actress, you know, playing his former love and this young woman. But, you know, right from the beginning, you have that watch and it just takes until about halfway, a little over halfway through the film for that one to pay off. Bergman's film is a delight visually to watch, even though it's a film that mostly takes place in an automobile driving <laughs> down the road to an award yeah. ceremony. But it's a marvelously alive, spectacular film for all of that. Now, it, it, part of that's because we move from the, the sort of almost new wave realism of the car scenes into the dream sequences and back and, and through the memory. And there are other scenes, but cinematographically he manages to capture so many different moods or tones over the course of the film. And you know, going back to the scene where they're eating lunch on the, you know, at the seaside and they begin to recite the poem, there's a feeling of, of life and freedom there as there is for a moment when you see the, the child, the summer home and the, and the strawberry patch. I guess you might just say that Bergman's palette is, is really varied in a film that nonetheless has loaded itself up with constraints and chains almost in the <laughs> beginning. You know, a 78-year-old actor who has to appear in every scene, who they're afraid is, as, as, you know, as the, the Wikipedia and other articles on the film t tell you, they're afraid he might die at, at, <laughs> at any time. It sounds like this is going to be a very burdensome, hard film to sit through. In fact, it's an absolute delight to encounter. It's less painful than the Virgin Spring, for, for sure, and, and the Seven Certainly. Seal. And yet, it has all of their their gravitas built into it, nonetheless. I didn't expect to be sitting down for a road movie with <laughs> this, and it was funny. There was at least one trope in there where a lot of road movies seem to have have to have a scene where the owner of the car objects to somebody smoking in the car and then eventually gives in. I can think yeah. of numerous examples of that, which is kind of funny. I think it's the sound is another interesting aspect of the, the film, especially Definitely. especially in the dream sequences. In fact, there was even one scene, a real life sequence where I felt they also had that echo effect, but it might have been my imagination. 
but yeah, it's very eerie where you have, especially he does this with footsteps and doors opening and closing a lot where there's an immediate echo of the same sound. The sound is like doubled Mm -hmm. right after just amazing at creating a dreamlike atmosphere. And then that first, in that first sequence with not only the, the wheel of the carriage coming off, but somehow just falling apart for no reason. Yeah. You know, as it rolls towards him, there's so many things that are, the you sound, know, the sound to, design to in that sequence is so unnerving. Like the, the creaking, creaking yeah. yeah. But then there's the heartbeat that starts to pulse when he yeah. sees the clock without hands, and and throughout, really, that was something I definitely noticed was that the sound design is used very effectively, especially in moments where Bergman wants to inject some uh, suspense. There's almost like a psycho thriller quality in some of these moments with the the soundscape that he paints. This film is often said to be somewhat autobiographical. And I came across a quote from Ingmar Bergman's autobiography. I was quite sure I was an unwanted child growing out of a cold womb, which it's very striking. I mean, this is sort of a lot of what the film is about. You know, also the fact that Bergman was, I think, towards coming towards the end of of an affair with B.B. Anderson at this time, who has a similar relationship with the protagonist of the film. Bergman had a very difficult childhood. His father was very strict, conservative Lutheran pastor with very strong ideas about child raising. I mean, he, as a child, he would be locked in a dark closet for infractions such as wetting himself. And so he had a a really rough childhood. And he, you know, he said that he lost his faith, you know, at the age of eight, although it took him much, much longer to realize that. But, you know, for all that, it's it's striking to me how seemingly hopeful this film is, Mm. you know, that that's it's very encouraging to see that it's a very warm film and it ends on a very, a very positive note. Right. Well, and Isaac Borg shares the same initials as Ingmar Bergman and uh, and also the casting choice of uh, Victor, however you pronounce his last name. It's my understanding that. He was a bit of a figure in Swedish film as an actor, but also as a director. A number of his films are up on the Criterion channel right now, one of which I think Ingmar Bergman pointed to as being uh, one of the most significant films he had ever seen, Phantom Carriage. So I think that there's also something of a father figure in the very performer that Ingmar Bergman has chosen to play this father as sort of representing this film lineage that Bergman comes issues forth from. So yeah, I, I think that there's definitely a lot of autobiographical strains operating in this movie. It sounds like even though he gave conflicting accounts of the origin of the film, the one consistency of the conflicting accounts is that they are autobiographical accounts of it. And so it does seem as if some of what I've been I, you know, claiming is a real mystery of the film probably dissolves a little bit when we particularize it to just Bergman thinking through the consequences of his own or the the character of his own childhood and his estrangement from his parents, you know, what's amazing is easy to believe the film is autobiographical because it's, it's so humane and so, and so particularized. And yet it does feel, have that feeling of a cosmic drama between two teenagers arguing about the existence of God. James, you were just at a conference, weren't you? Virtually. (laughs) Everything's virtual. (laughs) I was I was at the Dietrich von Hildebrand week long symposium. So how was that? Oh, it was good. You know, I go back and forth on Hildebrand's as significance as a philosopher. When I'm reading him, I'll think there are better ways to go about arguing these points. I'm just not interested in this. And then he'll say something that I'll think, oh, this has, has otherwise escaped the nets of my mm. thinking. And so now I've got to start all over again and <laughs> and reevaluate. And do you have any books coming out? Oh, thanks for asking. So I'm pleased to say I've got my third full-length book of poems under contract from Angelico, who did the, the Hanging God, my second book. And so I didn't intend actually to publish another book for a number of years. The Hanging God just came out in 2018, and then last year I had The River of the Immaculate Conception, which was intended, you know, just a one poem, and that you know that was intended to be a limited edition. So it wasn't really putting out another book of poems just a year after my last one, but. In part because of quarantine, I've just been way more prolific than I ever was as as a poet. 
And I'm writing much better poetry now than I ever did at any previous point in the 20 years I've been writing. And so then quarantine came and I wrote this 15 part poem quarantine notebook that was itself, you know, almost long enough to be a book. And so Angelico wrote and asked, actually, they wanted to know if I had another book that they could publish. I wasn't thinking about it. But when that when I got that note, I thought, I think it's time. And so The Strangest of the Good will be out December 1st. And it's it'll consist of 24 shorter poems than the long quarantine notebook sequence. And then what we were talking about at the outset about just how the coronavirus seems almost like a thing of the past because of everything that's unraveled in our country in the last 60 days. After Quarantine Notebook, there's one final, a separate part, and then one final poem called When that ends with an image of the, the death of George Floyd. And I just, I had to write that for a number of reasons, including that even two weeks after I finished writing the Quarantine Notebook poem, which is such a timely poem that's trying to be of our moment and trying to capture uh, what we're all living through together, it already felt like a different world. And so I needed to gesture two weeks later to really towards what's unfolded since. Well, that's really exciting. And where can listeners go to keep tabs on everything that you're doing? Well, I'd be grateful if, if people would visit jamesmatthewwilson.com. Now and again, I every time I publish something, a new essay review or a poem, or if somebody reviews one of my books or does something with my poetry, I, I put it up there. And I, I'm pretty good at keeping it updated because it's actually my virtual memory book. It's how I keep track of what I've done. So it's a pretty reliable archive. Great. Yeah, we'll, we'll be linking to that in the yeah. show notes. And I'll link to my past interviews with you on my other podcast, the Catholic Culture Podcast, and also to the Quarantine Notebook poems over at Dappled Things. And I'd hope, yeah, I would love to have you on when your next book comes out on the Catholic Culture Podcast. And frankly, I think we'd love to have you on this show again as well to discuss another film at some point, because this was really great. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, James. It was. No, I'd be happy to do it again. Yeah, thanks for the any attention you can give to the work and for a chance to talk about a good movie. I'm jealous. Was it Tony Esselin who got to talk about It's a Wonderful Life? Stage coach. Stage coach, yeah. Oh, Stagecoach. Okay. So have you not done It's a Wonderful Life? We haven't done no. it yet. So Okay. Well, just so you know, it's my favorite movie. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Very good. Well, so for the next episode, we are not watching It's a Wonderful Life, but we are watching... <laughs> do you want to do Grand Illusion? I think we should do Grand Illusion. Yeah. Have you seen Grand Illusion, James? I haven't. It's a fun one. No, I guess I better tune in. It's a fun one by Jean Renoir. It happens to be the son of the famous painter Renoir. Really? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, all right. I'm looking forward to learning then because I'm going to be. It's a fun movie. From a carte blanche. One of the first great prison escape films was a big influence on the film The Great Escape with Steve McQueen. Thomas, where can people watch this? Grand Illusion can be rented on, you know, a lot of the usual channels. I don't see anywhere that it's streaming, but, you know, you can rent it on Amazon, iTunes, YouTube. You can always join in our discussion uh, at the Facebook group facebook.com slash groups slash Catholic pods. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.